Queen and Mare, and I'm gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about migratory birds on St. Martin. So, what are the migratory birds? What are migratory birds? What makes them migratory? Anyone? They come from somewhere and they go somewhere else. They come from Canada, mostly the here, those who are here. They come from Canada, they come here and after, maybe they go back to Canada, I don't know. Yeah, so they're birds that, that go live in different parts of the world during different times of year. And, yeah, and on St. Martin, they're only part-time visitors. So if you think about the birds that you see, you might be able to imagine some of them that you think, oh yeah, I really only see them in the winter. So these are the migratory birds. How do they get here? They fly. And so, um, if you think about it, it's kind of pretty amazing. Like, until very recently, birds could get to St. Martin a lot faster than people. I mean, a bird can fly faster than a boat, you know. So, like, until the, I don't know, even know, like, when we had regular air travel here, it's the last 70 years or something. Even 70 years ago, probably, most birds got here faster than most people, you know. So, um, they're pretty amazing in that respect. And the birds that migrate here, most of them come from up here. So they spend the summer in North America, Canada, and then they'll fly down. Depending on what kind of bird they are, they might take different paths to get here. Some of them might stop and hop all the way through the Bahamas. Others might fly more directly. Some will stay here all winter. Some will keep going and go down to South America, spend the winter there, and then in the spring they go back up here so that they can make their nests and raise their chicks in the summer up there. Right? So let's meet a few of these birds. This one is a semi palmated sandpiper. This is a life size. <laughs> <laughs> They're actually like small like this. Um, but it's a bird, there's a group of birds that we call shorebirds or waders, and they have certain characteristics. They have like long legs usually, and they have a long beak. So they have long legs because they stand around in mud or shallow water, and they have a long beak because they stick their beak in and they try to find snails and crabs and stuff like that. Um, so a lot of these birds have these characteristics, and so you'll see a lot of them, and most of the ones that look like this are migratory birds on St. Martin. The ruddy turnstone is another one of these. And this one can fly really far. So some of these go from all the way from the Arctic, like Alaska, and go all the way down to Chile, and then they come back. So some of them can fly 27,000 kilometers in a year. And they've actually watched some of these, because if it has a band on it and you can see what number it is, you know the individual bird. So they found one of these birds and then saw it again three and a half days later and it had averaged over 1,000 kilometers a day. So they're pretty amazing flyers, this one. This one is the Wimbrel. It's another shorebird, it has long legs, a long bill. And this one nests up in the Arctic by Alaska and northern Canada. It usually will stop in southern Canada, and then it will fly directly here, and it takes maybe three or four days, day and night, it doesn't stop, they just fly. So this picture is taken right when one of these arrived. This one had just gotten here. How do you know? This one just arrived. Skinny. It's skinny, right? So look, it has the breastbone, and then on either side, it's like it's been almost like scooped out. See, when it leaves Canada, like this, <laughs> and then it uses up all of that fat on the way down. So when it gets here, what do you think it wants to do? It wants to eat. It wants to eat. And what do you think it eats? Fish. Mm, something else. You mean those shell? Crabs. Yeah, mostly crabs. 
So you know the little fiddler crabs? The one big claw? And they have the little holes? So this is made, it's like precision made to go into the hole and pull them up. So this eats a lot of those fiddler crabs. This one is another shorebird that you don't usually see. It's beautiful, right? But you rarely see it. It's called a snipe. So I think it's maybe more of an American term, but when people talk about doing a snipe hunt, a lot of times this is like a wild goose chase. It's like a contrived thing where you never are going to catch anything. Okay. And the, people say that because this bird is so hard to see that you never find it. And you can walk, you only ever find it when you walk and it's like right here and you didn't notice it and it flies off really quick. And so someone who's a good enough hunter to shoot one of these birds, what do you call them? Sniper. Sniper. A sniper. And the word sniper comes from Snipe, yep. So when these birds eat all these snails and crabs and stuff come down here and it's like this, what do you think they do? Continue. They can leave, yeah, they can keep going further south or further in some direction until they find a place that does have food. Um, what else? I guess they could go to another pond. That it still has water because it's connected to the ocean. Oh, they could so die, I guess. They could die, and maybe some of them do. Um, and did you take that picture, Mark? What? Did you take that picture? I did. It's great. <laughs> Thank it's you. It's a sad story, but yeah, it's a picture. Yeah, a willet, but yeah, he's like sort of out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but one thing to remember about these birds is that even if this was like the worst drought in human memory, these birds have been passing through for much, much longer. So if they couldn't handle occasional disturbances like this, then they wouldn't be here, yes? Do they alter their diet? Can they do that? Maybe they can alter they like their habits, kind of. I mean, like when you yes, go and see some birds, like, um, like a great egret, which is normally a fish hunting bird, right. and you see one on Stasia, they're eating lizards. the nightmare and getting desperate eating ducky stuff. Yeah, so I mean, they can yeah, change they, their they habits to a certain degree. Um, another thing they can do right now is they can go to the beach, right? Because you have all this sargassum, and it's all stinky, and we don't like it. But inside of it is all kinds of little animals. And so these birds, if the pond is dry, they are lucky for them. At the moment, there's a lot of nutrition to be had. And sargassum, yes, you had a question? Is it that seaweed? No, um, the sargassum is a kind of algae, it is kind of seaweed, but what these guys are eating is there's very small amphipods and little things like little insects and little crustaceans little that are shrimps, eating. Shrimps and crabs. Yeah, little stuff like that that live inside the sargassum and eat that, and the birds eat those tiny things. Is yes? this a sandpiper? Yes, this is another semi palmated sandpiper. Um, and so you has. Semi-palmated sandpiper is one of the little sandpipers like this, and it has black legs, and that's and the little one with the black legs is a semi-palmated. There's one that looks just like this almost, but it's a little bit brown and has sort of uh, light colored legs, and that's the least sandpiper, it's a tiny bit smaller than this. Yes? You want to find any or on Which this bird? Yeah. This bird you can find on this island, although I don't. I've not looked on Kimshaw Beach, they, but they sure they could be there. But um, this bird is definitely on many of the beaches right now. There are non-shore birds that migrate here. Ducks, for example. So the blue winged teal is a duck that comes down. And why do birds leave North America and come down here for the winter? Anyone? It's more than that, isn't it? Though because we can live up there because we have, can control our body temperature, right? And birds can control their body temperature. So a bird could live up in the cold, but there's no food. And that's really the key part, is that if you eat insects and it's too cold, then you're not going to have any insects. And if you eat seaweed or like little stuff in your pond and it freezes over, you're not going to be able to eat. So ducks actually come usually later in the fall, when it starts to get really cold up north. Like, shorebirds might be here starting in August, and 
the lot in September, and the ducks sometimes come October, November, or even December to come a little bit different time. Great blue heron is another bird that comes here. And if you look at this bird, right, it's very closely related to the great egret. They're almost the same, but just different colors, kind of. And so one thing you will notice is the great egret is here year-round, but the great blue heron, in the, where we live, is migratory. So similar birds can have different habits. The osprey on St. Martin, you only see it in the winter. But in other parts of the Caribbean, they live year-round. So it's the same species, but different populations can have different lifestyle, different habits. We also have a lot of these songbirds, these little small birds. And the American Red Star is one of them, lives in the forest, it comes down here for the winter. And if you have two quarters, that's about how much this bird weighs. Feel, you can pass around maybe. You can pass around. Feel that in your hand. So that's how much this bird weighs, and this bird travels thousands of kilometers to come down and spend the winter here, which is pretty amazing. Yes. Why does the bird have a mustache? That's a good question. A lot of little birds do, and it might have to do with helping them sense stuff. You know the way a cat has whiskers and the whiskers help it sense what's around it. I think that maybe they do that, but I'm not 100% sure. I, you can probably look it up and find out. But there are a bunch of birds that eat insects, especially, that have kind of little whiskers like that. Um, here's another one, the black and white warbler. This one weighs about the same as two quarters. And this one, you can see someone's holding it because they caught it to be able to put a ring on the leg. And when you put the ring on the leg, and then you catch it again, you can learn stuff about the bird. You can learn where does it go in the winter and versus the summer. You can learn how long they live, because you can see what's the longest number of years you keep catching the same bird. Or you could see if they come to the exact same spot every year. So this kind of bird on St. Martin will come to the exact same place, basically, every year. You would catch it in, like, if you had a net set up, like over here, you catch it every year. If you set the net up 100 meters away, you might never catch it. How, how long does it live? So how many trips to the water? Right? That's a good question. I will guess that this bird could live several years or maybe five years, but it's not going to live as long as some other birds. I think the bigger birds and seabirds and that live much longer. They could live 20 years. I think there's an albatross that have lived 60 or 70 years. I think that these birds, I'm not actually sure what their maximum lifespan is, but probably you would only ever catch it two or three times, maybe, if you combine the lifespan and also the potential for it to get eaten or what have you. Black pole warbler is another little bird, and this one you will see maybe for a week or two in around this time of year, but it keeps going to South America. So this small bird keeps going very, very far. We saw them two weeks ago on the Belfort. Yes. Oh, yeah, you saw that whole yeah. warbler? Yes. Yeah, he had the, the, the called them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 the ones he called were the, um, the yellow ones. Yellow warbler looks yeah. similar. It's hard to tell in this photo because it was not a very, didn't have a lot of sun. But this one is, yellow warbler's here all the time, and this one is uh, just passing through, and really only a week or two weeks out of the year you might see them. Um, so one of the things that this reminds us is that these birds are connecting this whole hemisphere. And if you want these birds to survive, you have to make sure that they have a place to live up here, and down here, and on St. Martin, and for some of them in South America. So it really shows us that what we do here, and the habitat we provide here, it has an impact over animals that live all in this whole area. So it really connects us to the rest of the world that we live in. And if you want to see some of these birds, obviously the Great Salt Pond is a nice place to see some. And you can also experience the heritage and history of our salt industry. The beach has a lot of these birds on them right now. Bay de la Major or any beach, 
even Kip Chubby probably has some of these birds. Um, there's a nice bird walk, it's called the Sac in the Tang de la Barriere. There's a beautiful platform in Coralina at the Tang de Luca. And if you're feeling adventurous, you can go to Peak Paradis, try to find the little songbirds. You might have trouble seeing them, but you might be able to hear them. And thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions?